Hi, I'm Paul Beck with, uh, I was talking about Japan flooding and China flooding and Bangladesh flooding and India flooding, you know, massive events, un unprecedented in, in many cases. Like in the case of Japan, over the space of nine hours, this little blotch here, this little white area, which is uh, total precip precipitable water, or total cloud water, rather, um, was responsible for unprecedented rainfall on this Kyosho Island in, in southwest uh, Japan, and it displaced 400,000 people. The rain was 770 millimeters in nine hours. Just, just phenomenal um, rainfall. Just because this little splotch occurred here and not over the ocean, you know, over here, look at this area here, which is all, you know, very high in total cloud water. It precipitated out, caused massive flooding in, uh, in China, southern part of China. Okay, so when, we when I talk about the climate casino, as the, temp as the Arctic temperature amplification increases more and more, the jet stream behavior becomes more and more wavy and fractured and fills the space in the Northern Hemisphere. It's a huge feedback for transporting heat up into the Arctic and cold air out of the Arctic down south. So, so it's an enormous feedback, which it, it's never really discussed much as a feedback. It, it should be. Um, so depending, you know, if you happen to have, you know, live in a city and you happen to get one of these little white splotches appearing, then you lucked out in the climate casino. Your city goes down uh, go de de Flambre, uh, or rather descends under the sea, uh, uh, you know, becomes Atlantis uh, 2.0 or 3.0 or whatever, right? You just get these deluges. Um, and there's a lot more water vapor in the air because it's warmer and warm air holds more water vapor, 7% more per degree Celsius increase in temperature. So when you go up in the high Arctic and you're 20 degrees warmer than normal, you know, there's huge amounts of water vapor up there. Water vapor is a powerful greenhouse gas, so that propagates the warming. So we're on this, you know, we have to decide as a species if we're gonna risk everything. Um, it's like a game of craps. If, if we're gonna risk everything on that things will be okay. We'll be able to grow food. We won't have, uh, you know, we're gonna lose Arctic sea ice and that, you know, the methane will stay in place and Greenland won't go melt like, I mean, th th that's like a pipe dream. This stuff is happening real time. We have to decide as a species if we're just gonna roll over and succumb to the effects of abrupt climate change or if we're gonna actually, uh, you know, try to take, crawl back from the precip uh, the precipice. We've gone over the precipice. We've grabbed on with our fingers. Our fingernails are holding. We're slipping. Uh, we're going to plummet down like Wally e. Coyote, or we're going to pull ourselves back up. And we need to get rid of uh, people like we, we, we. I don't know. We let climate deniers run free reign. Scientific community. The scientific community has to step up to the plate. You know, they need to. Instead of being, it's like herding cats, getting them to do something. But we need to herd all of these cats and get all the scientists around the world to, to uh, you know, say, look, we've got a global climate emergency. Here's what we need to do. Um, you know, that, that'll come, probably won't, it'll take a complete loss of sea ice for that to happen. But anyway, um, so one of the big interesting things is, you know, if you're following uh, climate at all, is Antarctica is shedding one of the light, largest icebergs in history, big enough to fill Lake Michigan. So when will that happen, right? We don't know. It's gonna. It said it could happen within days or hours. So I thought, well, let's look at the jet streams and see what they're doing because you know, if the surface winds are such that they pull the ice away from where it's attached, then maybe that will precipitate the, the breakup. So that's why I'm talking about this right now. So first of all, a couple things about this iceberg. You know, it's massive. It's massive. Here's a, this, if this is 250 meters, which is about um, 800 feet or so, the blue, 50 kilometers, 
is this scale here. Okay, this is 250, so the iceberg's actually, you know, it's hard to see in the 3D plot. It's probably about that thickness. 50 kilometers, this is the size of the iceberg, the typical shape. Um, the, the ice shelf, Larson C. The water in here would basically fill, essentially fill Lake Michigan, to give you an idea of how much fresh water is stored up in that iceberg. Um, and it turns out that when it breaks off, it could actually bring a lot of small chunks with it too. So here's where it is in Antarctica, Larson C ice shelf. Uh, Larson A and Larson B were north of it and they broke off. I'll talk a little bit about how they broke up because that'll give us an idea how this thing will go. I mean, it could break off intact as one piece or it could shatter into a whole bunch of different pieces. Probably one piece is the idea. This is a what's called an interfer interferogram. Um, in, it, you're looking at different polarizations from a satellite and you're looking at it's like if you shine light through uh, a piece of glass you can see these rings and things diffraction patterns in the glass if you were to bend the glass you're putting stress on it you can see these fringes spreading apart and getting closer together so the so they're showing essentially stress on the ice as you apply stress Different types, different polarizations of light get reflected differently, um, giving you these interference patterns. So looking, so they're they're changing over time. This is through, through uh, this is month to month. Okay, um, this is showing this is a type of pattern that we see, and what it's indicating is that there's these rift lines here that are breaking apart. So when this thing reaches the ocean here the whole thing can just move off and we'll get various small chunks appearing here you know this can happen anytime um and this is showing what happened with larson b in in uh, 2002 so this is a little movie over this from january 31st to april 13th you could see the difference okay so the, the ice just shattered and shattered and, sh and and basically was all gone very very quickly the whole shelf gave out now it looks like the this shelf will mostly just pull away because we don't see all these internal melt structures and honeycombing within the shelf um, okay so the problem is is you know it's 10% of Larson C that's affected and when that goes um, it will weaken the the rest of the shelf and uh, it will also increase glacier flow on the land and do all kinds of things and it's melting from below and blah, blah, blah. Okay, so when is this gonna happen? Well, first of all, this is uh, where Larson C is down here. This is where Larson B, what's left of Larson B, you know, it sort of looks like part of C. This is what B was in 98, in 99, 2000, Okay, so it was receding, and then boom, 2002, the whole thing just collapsed. Okay, as I mentioned, that's Larson B, and then this is Larson, so this is where we go from Larson C again. Um, and Larson A, I thought I had some, okay, this is Larson B, this is Larson A. Yeah, okay, oh, sorry, this is, okay, Larson B, here we go to Larson A, collapse event. This is 1995, okay, was the collapse event for A. And this is showing, this is showing B again, the collapse of B. Okay, so we had these major events. Um, so what's happening? So here's Antarctica somewhere. This is the Antarctica. This is the peninsula here. There's a little kind of island here. So Larson C is in this area here. This is uh, what the jet stream is doing right now, or, or actually, sorry, this is winds near the surface, and you can see what winds near the surface are doing. They're being blocked because this is a mountainous region, so they're not getting through. So if we go up in the atmosphere a little bit, um, this is about one and a half kilometers up. We're seeing some of the air, some of the wind. There's this vortex here. If this strengthens, it'll push the ice away more. So looking, that might. Be enough to trigger the breakup this is about three kilometers up in the air 
Okay, we've got this loop here, and this is part of, we're coming into the jets, so let's go to the jets here. Okay, so you can see the very powerful jet stream coming across here. This is a little island, Larsen C is here. So if the jets were to shift down slightly, the winds will greatly pick up over Larsen C, and that will probably uh, finish it off. So keep an eye on the jet streams to see how quickly it's going to take for C to disappear. This is just climate reanalyzer showing the jets. It doesn't show much detail down here. Okay, so um, so what are some of the other factors that we could look at for, you know, when is the ice shelf going to break off here? So I think it's really the jet streams that give you information because you can see this is the extent, you know, if you try to look at like wave height, because of course waves propagating, like this is ice right now, right? We're winter in the southern hemisphere. We've got a sea ice layer forming, only a meter or two thick typically, with gaps and polinas, polinias and something and stuff, but we're still, we're gonna lose, uh, you know, we're gonna lose sea. All we need is winds coming across here. You know, you can try to look at the ocean currents before the ice formed there. You can look at the sea surface temperatures before the ice started forming. You can uh, try to figure out how much melt there was on the un under underside of the ice shelf, things like that, etc. But generally, the best metric is the uh, is the uh, the jet streams, right? You can't tell too much uh, else from here. So you know, go back to the jet streams. Um, if you go to um, climate reanalyzer, you know you can look for. Uh, daily okay if you go home go back to the beginning here okay so you can do uh, five day outlook maps for example you can look at the southern hemisphere you know so you can see average temperatures temperature anomalies so you know look at everything in comparison to where Larson C is sitting right here so very very hot over here not over here so that's you know not gonna be conducive to the breakup. Um, minimum temperature, maximum temperatures, um, right, still well below zero. Precipitation, okay, there's some stuff going on here. Uh, this is precipitation in millimeters, a little bit of snow there, presumably. Um, average precipitation in clouds. Uh, okay, average wind speeds. You know, not much going on here. Pretty low wind speeds at 10 meters. Jet streams, again, there's not much resolution. It's just showing the streak. So you're better off looking at Earth Null School. Um, or you can actually go back and you can try to look at, uh, go back to home. And uh, five day outlook maps. You know, Southern Hemisphere. No, sorry, I just did that. Okay, where's my pig? Okay, sorry. Um, hourly forecast maps. Okay, hourly. The, so you can set up uh, map area, southern hemisphere, Antarctica. You know, seven day forecast. You know, pick what you want to look at, run the movie, and then you can try to see what the forecast is for the next five days. And you can say, oh, the, you know, the winds are picking up over there. You know, maybe that's a good day for Larson C to go. Blog, you know, post out, hey, I think Larson C is going, and if you fluke out and get the right day, then you're a genius. All the media will come to you, right? Otherwise, uh, the world will forget about you. You won't have your, your few minutes of fame. So the next thing, the last thing I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to start do a whole video on this, is recently there was this paper. Okay, in 2012, Francis Vavris et al., did a paper talking about the jet streams becoming wavier, relating it to Arctic sea ice decline. And what they've done is they've done a they've got they, they've done a paper here, which was published recently on amplified Arctic warming, mid-latitude weather, new perspectives on emerging connections. So I'm going to talk about some of the things in that paper. Um, much of what I agree with, but there's also some strong disagreements on some things. So I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about this, this, this next video will get a bit technical, but I'll try to explain it as best I can so that you can understand what the jet streams are doing and how they relate to our climate right now. Thank you.